As we meditate, we're engaging in good karma. Of all the possible things we could be doing right now. We're choosing to develop good qualities of the mind, skillful qualities of the mind. Mindfulness, alertness, ardency, concentration, discernment. The simple choice to do this is good karma, and as you maintain that choice, maintain that intention, that's good karma as well. The Buddha talks about two kinds of good karma. One is the karma that leads to a good course through samsara. Where samsara is not a place, it leads to good samsara-ing would be a more correct way of saying it. And then there's the karma that leads out, leads to the end of karma. Now there are a lot of people who don't like to think about karma. It sounds too mechanistic, too deterministic. Well, that's the way it seems. A lot of that kind of thinking comes from the fact that many of us don't really understand what the Buddha taught about karma. It's not that karma is a machine that meets out just desserts. As if your goodness or lack of goodness could be measured in precise terms. That's not the case. Some of the images the Buddha uses for karma have nothing to do with mechanistic things at all. Karma is like a stream of water with many currents. It's like a field with many seeds. You've got lots of actions in the past, some of which have already sprouted, some of which are about to sprout, some of which are sprouting right now. And a lot of that sprouting has to do with where you pay attention, where your interest is. That gives you an element of choice right now. It also has to do with the quality of mind you're bringing to the present moment. The Buddha talks about having your mind narrow or having it expansive. If your mind is narrow, your goodwill is narrow, your compassion is narrow, your empathetic joy is narrow, your equanimity is narrow. Your ability to deal with pain and not be overcome by it, your ability to deal with pleasure and not be overcome by it, those are narrow as well. And as a result, any little karma from the past is going to seem huge. It's like someone who has very little money and suddenly has a debt. If you can't pay the debt, you get thrown into prison. On the other hand, if your mind is expansive, if your goodwill is expansive, measureless, your compassion is measureless, your empathetic joy is measureless, or your equanimity is measureless, if you're able to face pain and pleasure and not be overcome by them, your mind is expansive. It's like having a huge fund of money. If you had suddenly to pay that same debt, you'd have much left over a whole lot left over. You'd hardly notice the, the debt at all, or the payment at all. So there's no question of precise meeting out of good and bad situations. It's a much more fluid process, and there's no sense of people deserving to suffer. There's a common view that each of us has a single karmic account, and what we see right now is the running balance, which is a very simplistic idea. And it leads people to think, well, if you see somebody suffering right now, they must deserve to be suffering, so you leave them, which is hard-hearted. Certainly not what the Buddha taught. We have lots of seeds. Each of us has lots of seeds. When someone's suffering around now, you don't, want to, you don't know what other seeds they have in their field. And as for you, you don't know what other seeds you have in your field.
And so the best thing to do is to develop compassion for yourself, for the people around you, and take that word deserve and throw it away. Unless you use it in the sense that everybody deserves compassion. Everybody deserves goodwill, empathetic joy. But again, it's not so much of what they deserve, it's what do you want to do with your life? How are you going to shape your experience? Give your goodwill as a gift, your compassion as a gift, to others and to yourself. And not the sort of gift where you expect something in return. I was reading about a Inuit hunter in Greenland. There was a European who was doing some walrus hunting on the coast of Greenland and came back empty-handed. He had nothing to eat, nothing to take home. And this Inuit hunter happened to have had a very good hunt that day, and he brought in hundreds of pounds of meat for the European. And the European thanked him profusely, and the Inuit hunter said, Don't thank me. I'm not doing this as a gift. This is something people just have to do for one another. And that's the attitude you should have for your goodwill. This is something you just have to do. This is part of being a human being. Goodwill for yourself, goodwill for others. And try to make it as expansive as possible, as all-inclusive as possible. You look at people who are wealthy, enjoying power and all sorts of sensual pleasures, and the Buddha said, don't be jealous. You've been there before. You, people, <clears throat> you see people who are suffering, horrible diseases, poverty, discrimination of all kinds. You've been there before. So what this means is we should have compassion for one another, for our own good, as well as for their good. It's a kind of compassion that doesn't demand thanks. It's just the right thing to do. This is one of the reasons why we begin each meditation with thoughts of goodwill for ourselves and for all the beings to learn how to be comfortable with those thoughts, because those are the right thoughts for human beings to think. And then we work on this business of learning how not to be overcome by pleasure, not to be overcome by pain. So with the pain, this means learning how to deal with whatever pains come up in the body right now as you're sitting here. There's pain in your back, pain in your th in your hips, pain in your legs. How can you learn not to focus on it? If you find that focusing on it actually makes it worse, you've got to stay away from it for a while. If you find that focusing on it helps you understand the process of pain, then focus on in. Take a proactive attitude toward the pain. In other words, don't just sit there complaining about it. Try to develop a sense of well-being someplace in the body, someplace in the mind, so that you can use that as your standpoint. In the beginning this may mean focusing on a different part of the body. Until you feel secure there, you're able to stay there and not get entangled in the pain. In other words, even though it seems to be calling your name, look, look, look here, you learn to ignore it. Until you're ready to deal with it, then you can turn around and probe in. See, where is the pain worst? And you find that it keeps moving on you. It's like mercury, trying to pin it down with your finger. The more you try to pin it down, the more it scoots away. Of course, now they don't let you play with mercury. But you can play with your pain. And if you can have that attitude of playing with it, that puts you on a higher level. You're exploring. You're trying to understand it.
and as long as you don't think of yourself as being victimized by it, then you can learn about it. And the level of suffering goes way down. You're not overcome by the pain. Similarly with pleasure. A little bit of pleasure comes up in the meditation and we tend to wallow in it and then we lose our focus. It's interesting that when the Buddha talks about how the steps of breath meditation develop feelings as a frame of reference, he says he classifies attention to in and out breaths as a kind of feeling. It's a strange statement because usually we don't think of attention as a feeling. But he's pointing out two things. One is that every feeling we have has an intentional element, just like every sense of our form of our body contains an intentional element. Every perception, every fabrication, even plain old consciousness contains an intentional element. Something that's fabricated out of a potential and turns into an actuality, just like the issue of past karma. What you focus on is going to become the actual karma you experience. And so it's the attention there that's important, that keeps that feeling going. He's also reminding you that you don't switch your attention away from the breath to focus in on the feeling. If you do, everything gets very blurred. Either you lose your concentration or it goes into a state of what John Lee called delusion concentration, where everything is pleasant, but there's very little definition of any kind at all. And you come out wondering, well, where was I just now? Was I awake? Was I asleep? I wasn't asleep, but you're at a loss to say where you actually were. The best thing to do when pleasure comes up is to not get distracted by it. You keep your attention with the breath. The pleasure will have its good effect on the body. If there's rapture, that will have its good effect on the body. Without your having to squeeze as much intensity out of the pleasure as possible. In fact, the more you just let it happen, let it be as you stay focused on the breath, the more it's going to be healing for the body and the mind. So these are the ways in which you develop that enlarged mind, that wealthy mind that's not appreciably diminished by any little debts that you may have from your past karma. The question of deserving or not deserving the happiness gets thrown out the window. It's not a measure of deserving, it's a matter of skill, and we can develop the skill if you want. So even though we often think of karma as something very Diametrically, diametrically opposed to goodwill. <clears throat> In other words, how can people be happy if they've got bad karma? That's not what the Buddha taught. The teachings on karma and goodwill go together. You realize the difference between suffering and not suffering is a matter of your skill in the present moment. The same principle applies to others as well. And as for the potentials coming from the past, you can't see them. You can't see other people's, you can't see your own. But if you sense that something is potentially skillful, focus in on that. And try to develop as much as you can. That way you're planting more good seeds. You're the one who decides how much you have to suffer. So it only makes sense that you decide not to suffer. And the meditation is what makes that decision a reality. <clears throat>